Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins and today I'm delighted to be joined by Donna Maloney. Donna, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about the world that you're involved in. So over to you, Donald. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, so yeah, my name is Donald Maloney. I'm, I'm a photographer by trade, but more recently a filmmaker. Um, I, I, uh, I'm based here in Dublin and 90% of the work I do is in Ireland. Um, I became a professional photographer when I was 27 years of age, having spent seven years working in Telecom Erin, um, uh, drinking more than working, to be quite honest with you, um, because uh, avoiding work was part of the, the, the brief. Um, and then I got married when I was 21. Um, and by the time I got to 27, I was I was a very keen photographer, obviously, but uh, I just hated every minute of my job. And I said to my wife one day, my then wife, um, I just need to pack this in. I'm going to give photography a go. And she kind of I was expecting her to say something like, are you fucking serious? But uh, um, she totally backed me and we went for it. And I got my portfolio together, went around the advertising agencies because advertising photography is probably the most lucrative of all the um, of all the photographic genres, if you like. Um, so, yeah, I packed it in. I had two kids, had no idea how it was going to turn out. Uh, but it did. It took a good few years, but it took nearly nine months before before I got my first job. And it was a, and it was a crappy little job that I got. But I've never looked back, but it probably took um, it probably took nearly 10 years to actually establish myself as a photographer. Um, because advertising photography is very, very specialized and I wasn't pitching myself as a very, very specialized photographer. I was just pitching myself as a photographer. I'll shoot your food. I'll shoot anything that moves. I'll just shoot an ad for you. But I just soon discovered, sorry, I didn't, it wasn't soon. It took me a while to discover that. This wasn't the way forward with photography. Um, so I love, love mixing with people and I love shooting people. And I decided that that's it. I'm going to concentrate on shooting people. And um, here I am uh, shooting people. So I had a very, very successful career. God, I sound like a, like, a, like an epitaph, but I, I'm, um, I, I still do have a very successful uh, photographic career. It's albeit not as busy as it used to be. I mean, up about... Seven or eight years ago, I was probably the busiest advertising photographer in the country. Um, now, um, not so much. Uh, I'm I'm not going to say it's ageism or anything like that, but there's a lot more photographers in in, in the world now, and it's particularly in Ireland, they're all good. They go to college now, for God's sake, well, college. What's all that about? But um, they go to college and they come out of college, and they're just desperate to get on that 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 ladder, the first rung, and get some work. So they're doing stuff pretty cheap and um and that's fine they're actually shooting themselves in the foot in the long run but um so there's i can't compete with that bread and butter work that i used to have with these guys prices so i don't expect anyone to ring me looking for sort of a bread and butter shot if you like so but the good thing is i do get considered for for the more lucrative or lucrative is the wrong word but the more uh more sexy jobs that 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 are available and um i don't get them all by any stretch of the imagination but i pick up a couple every year from a few very loyal clients uh which is great um so about seven years ago um sorry just bear with me because this is this this is a bit drawn out seven years ago i'd never shot video in my life i was purely a photographer man um and i still am to be quite honest with you but seven years ago, I was walking down uh, Westland Row here in the middle of Dublin, and I spotted a man who was homeless. Now, he was about 63 years of age, 63, 64 years of age at the time. And he was lying under a bridge in Westland Row with a big, long beard and a coat. He looked he was just literally in a sleeping bag. He looked like a Dickensian kind of a character. And uh, I thought, Jesus, I grabbed the camera, been been the becker I am. I, I ran across the road with the camera and said, do you mind if I take a photograph of you? And he says, uh, nothing. So I said, I'll take the photograph anyway. So I took this photograph of this guy, went back to the studio and went through all the shots, the contact sheet, if you like, and thought, oh, Jesus, there was one shot. I thought, that's really cool. I love that shot. I need to know more about this guy. 
So guilt got into me and I thought, no, I'll go back. Because I hadn't got permission to take the photograph, I rarely steal photographs from people when I'm when I'm out in the street. Not not, and that's not my genre, the street photography, but I love doing it. Um, so I said, no, I'll go back to him the next morning and I'll clear my conscience and say hello again. So I went back the next morning, and he was still lying under the bridge. Um, so I went over and I said, "Hello there, how are you how are you doing?" Sort of leaning there, how are you doing? And he goes, "Excellent, thank you." And I'm like, "What the fuck?" So I was immediately intrigued. So I got down to my hunkers and I chatted. We ended up chatting for, for 30 minutes. And I said, do you mind if I ask, do you have a drink or a drugs problem? He said, I should have, but I don't. And uh, I was totally intrigued by this, this guy. So I actually, so I befriended him. I used to visit him every morning and I'd, I'd drag him across the road for, 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 to, for coffee in, in the local cafe and whatever. And as I was beginning to develop a relationship with this guy, because I wanted to shoot his day and just capture his his world um, on film uh, or digitally, um, it became um, a bit of a, it became obvious to me, maybe I should be recording this, you know, in some sort of a video form. Anyway, I, rec I, I recorded our relationship um, and because he gave me more trust uh, and he's probably somewhere on the spectrum. So it's very difficult to get stuff out of him. But anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, I made a documentary about him. It's called Martin. Very, very uh, basic documentary um, that done really, really well. It went viral. And I loved the process of putting it together, shooting it and whatever. It became an obsession. And that was the moment I became a film filmmaker. So that's about seven years ago. So since then, I've been shooting a lot of shorts. Uh, and more recently, I've been getting commissions from RTE for some really nice stuff. Uh, and about four years ago, I shot my first uh, feature, if you like. But it was for it was it was for it was um, it was for myself because I put all the money in myself. But I was hoping someone would buy it, but no one was brave enough to buy it or to back it because uh, it was an Italian documentary. And um, so I spent seven months in Florence, going to and back Florence, Florence to Florence, um, and I made a documentary called Quattro Calori which is the story of a game in Florence called um, Calcio Storico. I don't know if you've ever heard of Calcio Storico. Calcio Storico is, is the nucleus of all sports games, you know, team sports games with a ball that you'll ever see. Um, now, I know there's lots of countries around the world would claim, claim, claim to have, you know, oh, we were the first to play football or rugby or whatever, but this is the sport that started everything. Um, Calcio Storico, which translates to uh, historical football, is a game played in Florence between four districts. You have the blue district, the green district, the white and the, and the red district. They're all associated with a church. These four districts do not like each other. Um, and once a year, they get together and they beat the living shit out of each other in the Piazza Santa Croce in Florence in a game called Calcio Storico. And you begin, when you first see it, you kind of go, this is just, this is just mayhem. There's, there's not, okay, there's guy, there's a ball, but they're just, they're all knocking, the, there's no rules. They're just knocking the shit out of each other and you, you don't know what's going on. So I, 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 I was intrigued by it. And I, I, um, I rang this newspaper and said, can you give me a commission to, to do, some, do a photography uh, piece on this? And they did. And um, with a lot of um, twisting of arms, greasing of palms and brown envelopes, I managed to get into this event uh, five years ago, four or five years ago, and covered it by photography. So the newspaper here done a lovely four or five page article on it, and it, it was just, uh, it blew, blew everyone away. Um, so I thought, I'd love to do a documentary on this thing. Just let me explain one thing about the history of Calcio Storico. So I'm boring everybody now about this Italian game. A Calcio Storico originated uh, during Roman times, before Christ, if you like, a couple of hundred years before Christ. And it was a game that was played amongst the, the soldiers to keep them fit when they weren't at war. So if they weren't at war, they all hopped on their horses and beat the shit out of each other with a ball or whatever it was to try and get from one end of the piazza to the other or one end of the camp encampment to the other kind of thing. And that's how the game originated. And it died off um, when the Roman Empire died, it died as well. So the people of Florence um, 
rejuvenated the game in the 1500s, the mid 1500s, and took it as their own. Now it's the only the only place in the world where they play where they play it. Where, where certainly where they play play it um, for real, if you like. Um, so I decided I'd um, get one guy from each district in Florence and document his life throughout the year leading up to this major event which happens in June. There's only two games, two semifinals, and a final at the end of June. It all happens in the space of two to three weeks. Now, you could play in a semifinal and you may not reach the final. Uh, sorry, you may win your game and get to the final, but you could end up in hospital before you get there. So the chances of getting through... These guys are supreme athletes. I'm sure the Romans or whoever played the game back in the day and in the earlier stages of, of the game in Florence... They were, it was just a brawl and whatever else. But these guys are serious athletes. And some of them are professional boxers. It's just they they do it for the love of their city. So I love that notion. And I made a documentary about it. And I brought it back to Florence with me three years ago to, 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 to have a premiere. And of course, then COVID hit. Um, but it went down a bomb in Florence. And the mayor of Tuscany said it was the greatest documentary he's ever seen on Calcio Storico. And so it was a, an enormously um, uh, pleasing uh project to work on so that was my first feature and although it's with it's on amazon prime if every anyone wants to see it uh it's called uh again quattro calori on amazon prime and it's there for everyone to enjoy it's a 72 minute documentary so um but i never made any money out of it to be honest with you i probably spent about 45 grand of my own money making it if i've made <laughs> if i've made about six or seven grand back that'd be about it you know what i mean but i don't care it was the most wonderful experience i've ever, ever i've ever had making making anything uh, but probably the most difficult thing i've ever had because of the language problem because of so many problems um but there was only there was only four people involved in making the entire docu. that was me a friend of mine who lives here in dublin he's actually originally italian my partner who speaks italian and a guy i had in, in florence who was my fixer if you like um so it was literally just the four of us made this this feature doc. I edited it, we graded it. Anyway, so so that was it. So uh, then along came RTE, and we're trying to pitch this pitch them this idea for uh, let the rest of the world go by. I don't know if you've seen that documentary, which is on RTE about two guys who got married to avoid an inheritance tax bill, a sort of an Irish solution to an Irish problem, well, a global problem, I suppose, and. Uh, that went down a bomb with RTE and uh, took a long time to convince them that, that I should make it. But um, as is, as is uh, many things, but uh, then I made Super Agers, which is the, the, the latest thing, which is a very lighthearted look at, 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 at aging and the benefits of aging. So um, benefits is probably the wrong word. The joy of aging. There are positive aspects in, in aging. Um and I was determined to 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 get that across in the in the new documentary that went on RTE. Um, I should probably give you a little bit of a background on Super Agers. I used to hate going over to. I, I love my mother, right? But I used to hate going over during COVID. The first thing I get when I walk in the door is, "Have you seen the figures today? How many's in hospital? Such and such died. Da 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 da. da. Oh, fuck, let me out of here. You know it's." Every day I went over to my mother, all I got was this rant about negativity, uh, can't get out of the house, blah, 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 and the figures. And this was every time. So I decided then that, you know what, ma'am, I'm, I'm going to just visit you maybe twice a week now, and that's it. So I remember discussing with my partner one day. I said, I can't go over there anymore. It's driving me crazy. I mean, it's bad enough we're in the middle of COVID, but having to listen to your mother throwing these th this shit at you. And you're being bombarded every day, as you know yourself, by, from the media, um, whether it be um, TV or radio or newspapers or whatever. It's just bombarded with, with, with figures and arguments and whatever else. So I said to my partner one day, why don't we make... Why don't we... All this negativity that's flying around, I'm sick of it. Why don't we make the most positive thing we could ever make about aging? Because in two years' time or whatever, whenever we come out of COVID, you're going to have all these old people that are going, that are going to be stuck to the chairs like Homer Simpson, who have never been outside the door in two years. They're, they're, they're at a really low point in their lives, and they should be at a point in their lives where they're still enjoying life, but they're being dragged out you know, down, down the drain, drain really slowly. They need a kick in the arse, firstly, but then 
they also need a good dose of, of uh, positivity. And um, add a, add a, uh, to add to that, we maybe be able to educate the younger people as to, shit, guys, this is coming down the line, but it ain't so bad because nothing you'll ever hear about aging is positive. So I uh, had a long um, chat with my partner, Patricia. Patricia Murphy is her name. She, she kind of, it was her kind of a spark that got the whole thing going. And I thought there has to be a bit more to it. So I started doing a bit of researching online. And I found this group in America called uh, who, who called themselves super agers. Um, now, it's not a medical term, but they're people of who have a very, um, what's the word? They have the, 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 the minds and the intelligence and the articulation and the bodies and the, excuse me, the fitness and the activity of people half their age and even younger. And um, I thought, that's really interesting. Um, I wonder, are there many of those in Ireland? I couldn't picture them. Anyway, we'd done a bit of research and met some people, da 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 and Super Agers was born. So um, we got stuck into that for, for nearly a year and a half, two years. So um, that's where I am at the moment. Sorry, I have to go. I, have to, I need some breath now. <laughs> Well, Dono, do you know what? I, I'm enthralled. I mean, it's such an incredible story. Thanks so much for sharing that. that. Because I, I'm going to go right back to the early days when you said, I work for Telecom Air, and for our international listeners, that, that was like the, the state sort of phone company, if you like, yeah. back then. Um, and to make that decision back then to say, look, I'm going to stop this. You know, that was considered a regular stable job back in the day. Oh yeah. To say, I'm, I'm going to go and shoot for, you know, I'm going to go and shoot. I'm going to be a photographer. That must've been a huge risk. Um, oh, completely. back then. Completely huge risk. I mean, my, my father who sort of had a bit of pull in telecom Aaron at the time, he, he was, he was sort of an inspector kind of thing. When he heard I got a job when I was 21 years of age in telecom, he thought it was the greatest thing ever. You know, I've set my son up now. He's going to have a nice pension. He's going to have a decent wage, and that will make him happy. <laughs> but little did he know, I, I mean, it, it was horrific. Um, I hated every minute of it. Um, all the while, I was, I was, you know, messing with cameras and stuff like that. But uh, when I told him that I was going to pack it all in, he was appalled. He couldn't understand how you could pack in a good pensionable job when you've got two babies at home and, 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 a, and a mortgage and, and all that and the risk involved. He just thought I was totally insane. Um, and, and, and it kind of was in a way, but, but I don't think I would have done it without, you know, the support of my wife at the time and, and, um, and, and everyone around me. So uh, yeah, it was a huge gamble and, and hope and, you know, it had paid off. Yeah. And the other thing that, that really struck me was you, you sort of mentioned that it took nine months to get your first commission, if you like, to get your first yeah. really paid job. And it wasn't this huge job either. But it, I think throughout those nine months, it kind of felt to me like you were kind of finding your way, figuring out the type of photography you're going to do. And you sort of you chase the advertising dollar, of course, because you need the money and you've got a family to support. Yeah, But, it, but you also sort of gave me a nice parallel to that where you talked a little bit about not so much ageism, but the fact that today people entering it without maybe the years and years of, of understanding the photography world, they may go to, I'm not, you know, I'm not putting anybody down by saying this, but going and doing a college course does not a photographer make. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of the components. And I think that if anybody goes to your website, which is donalmaloney.com, and just looks at the sheer, stunning, mind-blowing photography that you're producing, and we'll come on to the films in a moment, um, you can you know when somebody has a certain talent, a gift, and a passion for, for photography. And I, I'm sure that comes with time, uh, but you seem to have had that passion from a very early you know, age. You were kind of really something you wanted to do to give up that pensionable good job, you know, and the father going, what are you doing? This sounds crazy. Um, and to take nine months then for really to, to get your first job. And I'm sure it wasn't easy street since, you know, since then, I'm sure there's been lots of ups and downs oh, yeah. as there are in a creative field. But um, I suppose the question I'm getting to is 
how early on did you know that you wanted to do something in the creative area? Because, you know, you, the telecom air and job versus what you do today, it couldn't be more polar opposite. So how early on did you know? And why were you messing around with cameras? Where did that fascination come from? Well, the fast the fascination with cameras ca came from my uncle who gave me a camera one day as a president, a little Russian camera called the Zenith. I started playing around it and I was fascinated by it. Um, that's where the passion of photography, I joined a camera club and all that kind of thing. And I got more and more and more into it. But um, I didn't really become, a, I, I, I didn't, dis, I didn't know I, I, I could make a living at this up until like I was 27 years of age. It was, as I said, it was a huge gamble. And I, I actually didn't know whether I was cut out for it or I was talented enough uh, to be able to do it. But I certainly was mad enough to give it a go. Um, but when I was, uh, I, I used to look at these uh, back then, Photography was much more obviously analog, but it was much more of a craft. Um, so we didn't have the joy of of um, of uh, the digital world and instantly seeing the the image and whatever else. Everything was manual, um, and it's a great way to learn. And uh, I, I would advise any kid getting into the business now is to actually go back to basics and, and shoot with film. Um, having said that. I wouldn't touch a roll of film now. It was the last thing in the world that would keep me alive. I just, I, I could never go back into a dark room again. It's a nightmare. Digital is God as far as I'm concerned now. But um, sorry, I'm drifting away from your original question. I think I may have answered it there, but but uh, um, when when did I discover I I, I could make it? I I was I don't I don't know when I discovered. I didn't discover. I just I just had enough of my it was it was sort of almost forced upon me i need to do something else and i know nothing else and i'm talented at nothing else therefore photography is what i love let's give it a go um and when i say i didn't work for nine months um i was going around with a portfolio literally knocking on doors and going in to see art directors and advertising agencies um whereas now you go and see the the, the uh, producer or whatever um but you were going knocking on art director's doors and walking into agencies and showing them your portfolio. My portfolio was full of landscapes and, and beautiful photography, but nothing really that you could, if you were an art director, you could say, oh, this is, this could make a nice ad, or this guy could be a really nice uh, ad photographer because it was it hadn't got that polished look that, that advertising has. And that's only something you learn as you go along. I mean, I'd never worked in a studio. I'd never assisted a professional photographer. And in a, in a way, I'm kind of proud of that because I didn't become a clone of someone else, if you understand what I mean. I never went to college. And I, so I'm kind of proud of that in a certain, in, in, in a nasty kind of a way. Um, so I never got, um, uh, uh, you know, molded by 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 someone else. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm totally uh, self-taught. Um, but... I really pity the guys coming out of college at the moment. I mean, there's 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 so many photographers coming out and um, trying to earn a living, and I don't think they're it's 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 explained to them enough in college how difficult it is to make it in the world of photography, particularly because when you're a young guy, you just want to shoot fashion and you want to shoot pretty girls and you want to, you know, you want to be the it, you think it's rock and roll, but it's it's not rock and roll. It never is rock. And roll people who work in advertising um, and many people i know in advertising would would probably tell you that uh it's as near to rock and roll as you'll ever get is you if you work in advertising <laughs> um, and it's never near near it but um yeah i hope that answers your question it does indeed and do you think though that that journey and that sort of self-discovery and self-taught approach to it do you think that's helped with the filmmaking today oh completely Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I would, I would, I don't know how I would film anything or how I'd, I'd construct anything or how I'd compose anything or how I would edit anything. I don't know how I do any of those without the basic knowledge of the photography I had. And um, one of the things I do is um, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a control freak in that I, I, I like to shoot everything and I like this to be on top of the sound and I like to be in, you know, when I get the edit, when I get the, the, the stuff back home, I start editing it myself immediately. Even before I go to bed, I'll, that night I'll start editing and play around with it for, for, for a couple of days um, before I actually give it to a proper editor, if you like. 
um, so they'll know exactly where I'm where I'm coming from. But yes, the the basics of of what I learned through advertising and photography was absolutely essential to 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 um to being a filmmaker or a documentary. Yeah, I, I love that, Donald. And let's just talk about the Amazon Prime documentary then, because this old tradition, this somewhere between a, a boxing match and a sporting event, I think is probably... Legalised a- murder, I call it. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, it's an incredible story. Yeah. But of course, to have your documentary on Amazon Prime, I mean, that must, that must have been a great achievement for you at the time. I can see us filling Crow Park, which is a, a national stadium here in Ireland, uh, for an event of a similar ilk. I think we'd sell it out. Um, but um, You'd never get the insurance. There's no, you'd never get it, yeah. No one in the world it. would give you the insurance, uh, and, and which makes it even more amazing that they still do this today in Florence. So, yeah, yeah it's, in, it's an incredible story. And so what about the Amazon Prime? What about the sort of new distribution models for film? Because you're obviously being able to find an audience there on on Amazon, which is a huge global organization when it comes to film distribution, documentary distribution. Well, um, it's it's not really my my bat. I, I'm not sure I understand how the whole you know distribution thing works and whatever. But um, we were approached by a guy, and when I say we, by the way, I work with a guy called Paul Holmes who runs a. a, a production company here in Dublin called Ponder who's great for me he does all the the headache stuff with paper and, and, and everything else but um we were approached by a guy in New York who has a um who has a, a who we were trying to get to sell the documentary basically I really thought it would be a huge success in America because Americans love a bit of fighting and they love a bit of violence and they love a bit of glorified violence and they like <laughs> someone's going to kill me now for saying that but th- i just thought it'd go down a bomb with the ho- especially with mma and everything the way it was so big a couple of years ago and still is i suppose i thought they'd absolutely adore this um so he, he we got we got on the phone to him and we spoke to him for, for for a couple of hours and then a few few days and whatever else and he said he put it up on amazon prime hope or sorry he didn't say he put it on amazon prime he said he'd try and sell it to hulu or to he pitch it to to a couple of um of stations in in the US and he he would be surprised that one of them didn't come forward and I thought great I'm going to get me money back at least uh it, just I want half of one to even come up come forward and then and, um, anyway no one came forward no one came forward and I thought oh shit I mean I can't surely surely some anyway um he has the power to put anything he likes up on Amazon Prime this guy now it doesn't sound half as glamorous it's not as half as glamorous as it might sound when it goes on Amazon Prime, sometimes they'll pay you to put it up there. What I, the way it works with me is, I get fucking zero point one dimes per view kind of thing. So, um, as I say, I've never, I'll never make the money back I did on Amazon. It's, 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 it's a, it's a lover, lovely feather in my cap that it's on Amazon Prime, but it's not quite as, as, uh, not nearly as lucrative as, as, as it may sound. Um, yeah, I can understand. I can understand that, but I suppose as a when you, I'm going to come on to RTE in a moment, and for our international audience again, RTE is sort of the state broadcaster in Ireland, um, and the documentaries work and uh, um, filmmaking that you've done with RTE. I'm going to come on to that in a second, but I suppose I'm I'm making the comparison. I was talking to the director recently of um, the Three Day Millionaire, which is currently at the time of recording this. It's number five on Netflix. And uh, the Three Day Millionaire is the story of, you know, the guys that used to come off the fishing trawlers in Grimsby in the northeast, you know, the north of England. And they had they had to blow their wages in three days. That's what it was called, the Three Day Millionaire. <laughs> but um, just the story of getting, I suppose, what would be termed in inverted commas, an indie film uh, to get up on Netflix, et cetera. It's a journey, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's not easy. Um so huge congratulations on on the documentary and the filmmaking, and of course the photography continues uh, with the great work you're doing there. But tell me a little bit about working with what what is I suppose Ireland's national television station. Um, how does that work? How did the documentary come about there? And because um, it was seen by a lot of people here, a lot of people have have really really embraced it. Yeah, it is. It's it's. I'm I'm blown away by the amount of the positive the positive responses um, after Super Agers, and um, and watch this space. You never know what might happen. Um, 
but I should, I should, when, when you're going to talk about RTE, I suppose I should go back to the first documentary I'd done with him, which was two and a half, three years ago, which was Let the Rest of the World Go By. I'd trying to be, I had been trying to sell that idea of Let the Rest of the World Go By to RTE for, um, for quite a while and they weren't biting at all they kind of went oh you know what the reveal is there everyone knows what happened because it'd been a big event that these these two old, old guys were getting married to avoid an inheritance tax bill and it became, that went viral alone so i suppose there was a fear that you know i was making i was going to make a documentary that everybody knew the how it ended but when as it tur- turned out we didn't know how it ended but the, um it, it was very difficult to get it across the line um I suppose when you're dealing with RTE, you know, there's a chain um, that you got to, that it has to be filtered through before it goes to someone that actually gives you the, okay, go make it kind of thing. Um, But to be honest with you, uh, I'm not licking arses here and like that, but I, I, although the process is very slow and, um, you know, they have been really good to me. Um, Big difference, I think, when I made Let the Rest of the World Go By, I I, um, I had put a, an edit together, and that's when I realized I was dealing with someone else that was going to take over, you know, the reins of the of the gig, uh, Let the Rest of the World Go By. And when they told me, no, nah, you can't edit it like that. People, people and how, the, the big difference between shooting or editing a documentary for tv and editing a documentary for cinema it, they're worlds apart if you're doing something for rte or for any tv station you got to front load the documentary you got to grab people immediately um so you nearly have to tell the story in the first 30 seconds um and then you get into uh which wasn't my plan with less the let the rest of the world go by but rte kind of insisted no 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 uh People are at home with their zappers. They're going to flick you on. And unless you get them in the first two, first minute, they're going to flick to another station. So you have to grab people by the balls immediately. So within the story, without giving away anything, the, the guy who, one of the older guys died at the end of the movie. But I actually flipped the story around. So the first thing we see is a guy lying in a coffin. And I immediately go, fuck, you know, what's going on here? So that was... That was the difference between it being a cinema piece and a TV piece. And that's the difference between making um documentary for 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 TV, for RTE, whatever it is, and making TV for cinema. You're not allowed the luxury. When you're stuck, when you're in the cinema, you're stuck there. You can't move. You want to go for a P, but you can't go. Well, you well, you cannot, but you, you, there's no way out. With a TV station, you got your zapper. zapper. So um, it's a different format. It's a different um, skill. Um, so I learned a lot during the first um, documentary with RTE. And uh, they kind of, you know, educated me um, as to how I should move forward with any more work I'm going, going to do with them. But I've no complaints about them. That's being honest with you. I know a lot of people in Ireland, you know, oh, they're terrible waste of money. I'm not paying me TV license, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I, I have no complaints. <laughs> I have no complaints. Yeah, I suppose it, it's good and bad with, with state broadcasters. You know, you've got yeah. people that, that think it's, the, it's like the BBC, uh, you know, in the UK. It's People think it's, you know, one of the best things for producing content and supporting the creative arts. Other people think it's a complete waste of money. So whether it's Ireland, the UK, or whether it's further afield, um, I think that that argument rages on. But um, I really appreciate you, you you sort of giving us that insight into the TV and the film world. And obviously all this stemming from, you know, what is it, over three decades now of great photography work. So, I mean, it really is a portfolio. And to be a filmmaker, you know, somebody who's produced for TV and film uh, and also uh, all the other great work that you do. And, I mean, it, it truly is a fantastic body of work. And I want to ask you, Donald, you know, genuinely, what do you love about what you do? Because you must get a real kick out of this still. Uh, I'm like I'm like a child with a new toy. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a little idea at the moment that I can't tell you about. And I just, I'm itching to get out that door with a camera. I'm itching to go and meet, meet these people to get out there and start shooting. Um, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like, um, I remember in America, I was in uh, California a few months ago and, um, I was talking to this Vietnam war vet and he said, I said, what's war like? And he says, war is like, 
he's like, uh, <laughs> I can't believe I'm drawing this comparison. He says, warm, war is a lot of boring, boredom, sitting, sitting around being bored, punctuated by minutes of sheer terror. And uh, it's a bit like I spend a lot of the year um, sitting around whether it be working on concepts or playing with stuff or playing with photography, I go, uh, uh, what will I do? Uh, I, I'm bored. Uh, I just, I don't know what to do with myself for, for many months of the year. And then when I get the the, the thumbs up from RTE or whoever, okay, let's, let's get cracking. I'm all over it. I'm just, I just, I'm unbearable. I just, I get an adrenaline rush that keeps me going for, for, for months. And um, I just, I just become a totally different person. Um, it's it's the best it's the best fun you'll have with your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I love I love shooting and I love the equipment. You know, I love the the excitement of traveling to shoot and the possibilities to explore people and, and locations. And because I'm a photographer, I'm looking for angles, and I, I just love doing all that. Love doing that, and I love me meeting interesting people. And that's why every nearly everything I shoot now is with people. So they're kind of. Uh, portraits or profiles of people who really interest me i love crazy people i love this is a terrible i love mutants and i, I love i love uh people who are just off way sorry way out, outside the circle <laughs> um i i really enjoy um uh ca capturing their lives and uh, what they have to say and one of the other things I just wanted to squeeze in, because I do want to change gears in a minute and ask you a little bit about yourself as well and some other areas, but um, I've been talking recently to a couple of uh, filmmakers that specialize in mobile filmmaking. And one is Cassius Rayner, who's an award-winning mobile filmmaker. And another person was Rob Montgomery, who is a, he basically trains a lot of the mobile journalists around the world. So he's in with the biggest news agencies, companies, et cetera, around the world. And you you referenced a moment a little while ago that you sort of there were four of you in the team that helped put you know that one piece of work together. Mm. Do you think the technology helps today? Because years ago it would have been, you know, uh, food trucks, camera trucks, uh, rigs, rails, everything. Or you know, Not has the technology <laughs> helped, or is it just a matter of budget? I know there's no, there's never no, you'll never get rich being a, being a documentary maker, but but. It's it's much more fun than making film. I mean, I have I, I've never made a drama movie, um, uh, although I've been involved in a lot of ads, you know, shooting ads and stuff like that. I also direct some ads or have done, um, but the budgets are are just not there. I mean, you said food truck, you tell me it's it's it doesn't happen on a documentary. It's very much um, on the hoof um, equipment. Um, well, obviously, obviously, it's a lot easier now. I mean, you can see everything in the back of the camera immediately, whereas back in the day, you used to have to rely on Polaroids and everything else to check exposures and and, and what have you. But uh, no, it's a, it's a lot easier now to to uh, to make really great looking documentary and and film. Yeah, and I think there's a some people get very particularly. Again, I don't want to. I, I don't want this to sound um bad in any way but people particularly these content creators in inverted commas they invest an awful lot in the tech and you hear about tech porn where it's the latest camera the latest gimbal the latest stabilizer the lighting the and yet the bit that's missing i think in a lot of cases is the ability to tell a story whether that's telling a story through a picture or whether it's telling a story through a documentary. And I was talking to uh, one of one of the, the really uh, talented New York Times uh, cartoonists, and she was telling me that, you know, she considers herself to be, um, you, you know, it's journalistic being able to tell a story with a comedic twist in one image compared to, you know, a full page of a broadsheet newspaper like the New York Times, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just that sort of seems to be that that missing piece between all this technology and yet fundamentally, you said it earlier on, going back to basics and being able to tell a story through the art and the craft. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, just probably just to repeat what you've just said in, in that 
uh, it doesn't really matter about the equipment. You, you can have the crappiest equipment in the world, but if you've got a really good story, it won't matter. No one will hear. No one will judge the, the no one will judge the sound or the or the picture or anything else. If you've got a really good story, it it just it trumps everything really. I mean, it's all about story. Um, so I'm very lucky in that my partner, who's a writer, Patricia, um, is a writer. Um, so she keeps me in check as well. So because I'm very much a visual person. I mean, when I was a kid, I never really read books. I, I, that's one of my regrets in life. Well, not, not, not necessarily a regret, but I wish I had read a few more books. I'm not a good reader. I mean, uh, it was to, to me, my biggest inspiration comes from music um, and uh, sport and and uh, uh, but and it was it's the same with music. I I only scratched the surface of, of things, so I I just I much prefer uh, the visual aspect. And and I wish I had read a bit more to understand story a bit more. So when I'm trying to create stories now on film, uh, Patricia sort of taps me and goes, "No, no, 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 no! You can't, you can't do that's." That makes no sense whatsoever because I'm going off on getting the beautiful shot. No, no, no. You can get all the beautiful shots you like. If, if you come, if you, if you, if it, if it doesn't lend itself to the story, there's no point in you shooting it. And that is the temptation when you're someone like me. And a lot of cinematographers and photographers is that we forget about the story. We just want to get the most beautiful image you can get. Um, but and, and we often do, but it makes no difference. I've seen some great movies. I'm sure you have that look beautiful, but they're absolute crap. You know what I mean? It's it's <laughs> unfortunately that's the way it is. Yeah, it is, and it, sometimes the things that are shot without the multi-billion-dollar budgets, you know, the crazy money, um, yeah. actually have some of the best stories, right? I think that's what attracts yeah. me a little bit to more of the the indie films, and particularly the documentary. Um, and yeah. Lisa Donnelly, who I was referring to earlier, who's uh, the New York Times, you know, CNN cartoonist, etc. But um, she would consider herself a video a video journalist. Uh, yeah, that was the term I was searching for because you know she does a lot of live drawing. You know, she's on the subway, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and just she's backstage at the Oscars doing all the the live drawing and that kind of stuff. But she she just was explaining to me the ability to tell a story just through an image. And, yeah, you know, when you get into that level of thinking about storytelling through the imagery whether it's film or you know in her case uh, literally drawing or yeah uh, whether it's photography th there's there's a very um a very important link between the storytelling the tools and the uh the medium i think and it's a, it's a fine art donald and you obviously have that in droves thank you very much <laughs> uh, uh i suppose um I think the, the document, what, what I really love about the document documentary making is that you don't know how the story is going to develop. If you shoot in a movie, you know, you have a storyboard for your day. You've got to capture this scene, this scene, this scene, and everything is choreographed, if you like. With documentary, it can change overnight. It can change when you arrive at the, at the scene. It can change when you arrive, the, the person's in bad form. Every you, you, Everything can change so quickly. Um, that um that's that's a real buzz in itself you don't know how the story you, you set out with with this lovely notion of how the story should begin and, and end but it kind of develops itself i've never shot it and that that has actually turned out the way i thought it would turn out but what it seems to work itself out in the end i don't know what it is it seems to work itself out in the end i find something in the middle or or oh maybe i'll drag it in this direction because such and such isn't well or whatever, or someone's in bad form or that's not going to happen or they don't want me to do that. So, uh, so you, you're, 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 you get all these challenges. And uh, so, yeah, that's the beauty of documentary. You never know what's, 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 uh, what's, what's going to happen tomorrow. I love that. Well, look, I do want to change gears a little bit. And before we run out of time, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions if I can. Yeah. Um, now, whether it's during the downtime where you're waiting on the commissioning call or or not, or whether it's just about your learning style in general as you've gone through life and continue to 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 uh, do all the creative things that you're involved in. But when it comes to your own learning style, are you an avid reader of books? Do you listen to podcasts? Are you just watching documentaries? You know, uh, how does it work for you and what kind of things do you find yourself absorbing? Um. 
not a great watcher of TV, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, I watch a lot of documentary. I do the whole Netflix thing and I do the whole YouTube thing and Vimeo uh, and whatever else. I'll see, Vimeo is great because there's a lot of new, there's new stuff coming up there every day that are that where people are experimenting and, and there's some really talented people out there. Um, music is still my biggest inspiration. No question about that. Um, when I get bogged down, um, I go for a walk. Uh, um, or have a bath um, but music is still my biggest inspiration believe it or not that, that trigger that it seems to trigger something in my head and um, every time I, I, I have the the calmness to actually sit down and listen to music so certainly sir um, what else do I do um, love still like going to the cinema although I've become very critical now because I'm so I'm more knowledgeable than I was a few years ago. So, I mean, you know, you, I, people ask me recently, do you love, what do you think of the Banshees of Inish Aaron? And I don't know how to answer it because I know the hard work has gone into it. And although for me, it's not a 10 out of 10, I still, I can still see, you know, things in it that are really, really great, but I can actually also pick out other things that I don't like. So um, I've become very critical um, in that sense. Um, but uh yeah, no, I probably spend more time searching, searching the net and and uh, googling and and, and um, uh, investigating, you know, Vimeo and YouTube and and whatever else if I get an idea. Yeah, love that. Um, next question. By the is... way, my biggest hero, big, my biggest hero. By the way, my biggest hero when I was was a kid and still is is Frank Zappa. Now I don't know a lot of people of a certain age probably are not aware of Frank Zappa. To me, Frank Zappa was God. When I was a kid, he was God. <laughs> and when I was in LA recently, um, sorry, that sounds really pretentious. When I was in LA recently, it was the only time I was ever in LA. Um, the one thing I wanted to do was go and visit the grave of Frank Zappa. And there is no grave of Frank Zappa. It's an unmarked grave. Frank Zappa was probably the most creative person that that I've ever encountered. Um, although I never met the man. Um, sorry, I've I, I gone off. Piece no, but there. I mean, I, I think you're right, because he, he was very much characterized for his non-conformity, wasn't he? I mean, he was a, yeah, yeah. an original thinker, you know, he was yeah. out there, yeah. So, um, yeah, again, very creative. Um, or ridiculously other, creative, yeah. Yeah, and it's great that you mentioned uh, Frank Zappa, because I was going to ask you, throughout your life, throughout your journey, there must be people that you admire, that inspire you, that maybe have helped you along the way, or maybe it's a, a particular type of character trait or personality type but when i ask you that question is there anybody that springs to mind and um, well i mean apart from zappa i mean and, and all the music you know the 70s for me were, were huge in terms of the music coming out I, to me the 70s was the most um was the most creative musical period in the modern era for, era for me the 70s was because you had like you know for me it was zeppelin and sabbath and wishbone ash and and bowie and um dylan and all these guys were doing their thing but i was never really listening to the words i was much more into the uh the riffs and melodies than the words if you understand what i mean so um a riff or a melody would would inspire we would would strike something in my head you know that kind of way so but i've worked with many talented people in advertising um that i that hugely admire as well i've worked with some serious seriously talented art directors and uh, copywriters who 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 blow my mind. I mean, was out last night for with, with one guy who just we sat in the pub for two hours and he just made me piss myself laughing for two hours. Like you know what I mean? There's there's some really seriously pe serious people that work in advertising in, in in terms of art direction and and copywriting. Um, so so I've had a world of thirty years of working with advertising people and and more. Um, so I've always been part of that sort of clique which is probably not the right word but uh of mixing with art directors and copywriters um so it's always been um collateral uh creativity or it's 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 certainly has touched me um over, over the last 30 years and so they've kind of taught me as well in a roundabout way um so i come from an advertising world so when i when i um very more often than not when i'm shooting something and, I, and i'm trying to frame something or compose a shot i'm thinking in advertising terms so i'm trying to make it look beautiful even though i don't have time to light something i'll still try and get the, the comp composition right i'm still or oh, maybe they might want to put a headline in there or some sort of thing. Uh, and that's the way my head works um uh when i'm trying to compose something so uh, as dirty as advertising is 
uh, it's been a great help to me over the years. And when you think about advice, um, what's the best advice you've received? Or has there been advice that stuck with you that you think was a great life lesson? For me, it's always the, I wish I'd have known that years ago kind of moment. Mm. But um, is there any advice that you share with people? Or is there any advice that you really hold dear that's helped you? Um, actually, the, the, I'm not sure um, the, of any one piece of advice. Probably the, the probably the, the probably the, the best bit of advice was something that I learned within myself, and that was um, to just shoot what you do, do what you do, do what makes you happy. Don't be doing what other, but don't be trying to please other people. Once you once you go there, you're in trouble. You, you'll never please them and you'll want to please everybody. Don't try and please everybody. If you please yourself and enjoy doing what you're doing, fuck the begrudgers. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's a uh, good advice. You know, do what you love, I think is uh, always a good path. Um, yeah, I mean, to be happy, we all want to be happy and, and yeah. to, to go to our happy place, we need to do what we, what, what, what we enjoy. Yeah, no. All too often, and when I'm speaking to people, you know, they they reach a certain point in their inverted commas corporate career, uh, and then realize they've been climbing the wrong ladder, and it's not really what they want to do. Um, mm. And I think there's a there is a great freedom uh, if you can uh, to make the change and to really focus on what you want to do and to, you know, what do they say? It's not a dress rehearsal, right? So, and it's never too late to retrain either you know what i mean I, I always tell people i always tell people that like i'm sort of some sort of guru i'm not at all very, far from it but it's never too late to retrain if you if, if you if you hate your job and you can afford to change it or you can afford the time to change it it's never too late to to, to go after what what you love doing it won't be easy oh, yeah for sure and when you when you look forward now um because you kind of hinted at something else on the horizon maybe but and I don't mean to pry, but when you look forward and you think about planning the next six, nine, 12 months, what's on the horizon for you? What are you hoping to achieve? What does it look like over the next year or so? Well, it's it's really exciting because usually people of my age um, are coming to the end of their careers. They're sort of approaching retirement kind of thing. And But I've never, I've no intention of ever retiring. Um, I, I can't I can't imagine not having what I have with documentary. Um, I've got two projects that I, well, I can't discuss, but um, because until I get the the go ahead and, and the money promises that that hopefully may come, if they if I get go ahead on the two of them, I'll be just out the door for the next six nine months. I'll just it'll be one of those adrenaline rushes, and then by the time Christmas comes along, it'll just be all done. Um, I just I just love love doing what I do. I mean, and and coming up with decent ideas. So I mean, there's two ideas in the pipeline now at the moment, and I I'd like to be I I've no sort of desire to to, to create um, some magnificent movie drama movie or anything like that at the moment. I just enjoy documentary too much, and as long as I just keep doing what I'm doing, I'm happy. There's no, I've no desire to get rich. I've no desire to do anything like that. I, as long as I keep doing what I'm doing and people get a kick and if they get a kick, like they got out of super agers, like, you know what I mean? I take that every time. That's what another little difference between advertising, the advertising world and documentary making world or filmmaking world is that within the advertising world, you're expected to create a beautiful image. You're paid to create a, a beautiful image. Let's face it. You're paid to do what you do. You're paid. You're, that's your job to make things beautiful. But um, so you rarely get feedback, but within documentary, you do, you get feedback from, 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 from the public, which is fantastic. You know what I mean? And it's kind of that, that kind of drives, drives me as well, to be honest with you, to, 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 um, to, 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 to know that I'm doing something good um, and to, to know that people are getting a lot of pleasure from what I'm doing. And I'm doing it because it's something I want to do and it's something that makes me, me happy. And if the, if the, the, if the, if that makes other people happy, great, you know? So there's no big plan, no big plan at all. Just carry on with doing what I'm doing and who knows what's great. It's the excitement of knowing what's around the corner as well, but um, we, we just have to see. I think you have a busy six to 12 months ahead by the sound <laughs> of things. It, it sounds very exciting. And uh, I suppose the last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up today, Donald is, um, is there anything that, that I haven't touched on that you'd like to share with our international audience? And also, and probably importantly, if people want to find out more about what you do, 
uh, or the work that you've put out and produced, uh, where's the best place to send people to? Well, probably my my website was probably better in terms of um, my, my my website has a has a has a flavor of of, of everything I do, I suppose. Um, uh, I don't know where else to send them. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. I've got the the whole thing going on like like anyone else. But other than that, I can't really send them anywhere else. Um, have I got a message? No, I I, don't, I think we've kind of covered what I what I need to cover. I don't I don't think I have any. Uh, I don't think I need to rant about anything that 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 this this might be the time to do it. But I don't think I really do have a rant about everything. But um, just to go back to super agers. Um, one of the one of the the goals with super agers was to show people that um you're not you're not dead when you hit your 60s you, you're you're only starting i mean don't within advertising you're kind of finished when you're 50 you, you, a lot of people get pushed aside once they hit that 50 mark and there's a lot of because they want new ideas and they want young kids to keep working on new ideas and it's very hard to keep your finger on the pulse as you get older but that doesn't mean you're any less creative than you were um so uh in fact, I'd say I'm probably more creative now than I ever was in my life. Um, so go all guys. I love that. I like that a lot. And Donald, that's a lovely place for us to bring this discussion to a close. So thank you so much indeed to Donald Maloney for joining me here on the Global Discussion. Thank you to everybody who's been watching or listening to this episode around the world. Uh, I hope that you will join me back here uh, for more discussions with creatives, leaders, and thinkers. So thank you, Donald. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.